Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Coach's Corner. Super excited today to have my friend Ian Murray with us from Atlanta, Georgia, and Dynamo Swim Club. Ian, how are you? Doing well, Mike. How are you? Doing great. Are you doing anything for ASCA in the clinic this week? Uh, no, no, we're not. We're not doing that right now. I mean, we are doing some coach education stuff on the side. We're trying to, um, but we've we've got probably too many moving pieces to unfortunately participate in that right now. There's a lot of things happening at Dynamo right now. I know you're really excited about the new pool. Do you want to tell everybody how the progress is coming along with the new facility? Yeah, it's not so much a new facility. Um, you know, we, we have an outdoor 50 meter pool uh, that eventually was enclosed with a temporary structure in the late 90s. And the structure that went over that had reached its useful life. Uh, we went through a capital project to replace that and had the funds in place and we're scheduled to begin construction this fall. Um, and then obviously COVID struck and um, we had the opportunity to speed up the process or actually just expedite when we were going to begin uh, actual construction. So we did some work to the actual tank. So if you've actually swum in that 50 meter pool, there's some tiles and stuff like that. They're a little shabby that needed some work and um, cleaned up that part of it. And then we've put a new, um, I, I like to call it a temporary permanent structure over it uh, that allows us to keep the open air feel because you can basically open it up all around um, that big sliding doors. Uh, but it can also be buttoned up completely so that in the winter that it is going to be climate controlled and protect us for the, you know, the couple months, uh, you know, where it does get a little cold down here. So we're excited to have that going through the final inspections, hope to be in the water later this week. It's awesome, man. It was 48 degrees this morning on deck here in Victor when we were outside training. So I, uh, I'm envious of the cover and, and the little bit of heat you'll be able to preserve. Ian, one of the things that we're going to talk about today is the USA Swimming Club Excellence and Recognition Program. Can you first explain to everybody what the Club Excellence Program is, and then secondly, why it's so important to you in the program at Dynamo? Yeah, I mean, Club Excellence is, is one of the many recognition opportunities that USA Swimming gives to its 1,800 members and 1,800 member clubs. Um, I believe it's been around for about 20 years, and uh, it's evolved over time, but essentially you're, you're rewarding performance. And um, I think the idea is to celebrate uh, true age group development and, and a good transition in the senior swimming so that you are seeing elite action at the 1800 level. Um, so there are three recognition levels, bronze, silver, and gold that are based off of time standards. Uh, the bronze standard, uh, which is really just to begin earning points for the program, is usually the long course junior national standard. Uh, silver is usually tied to the long course national standard or something of that equivalent, depending on the year and, and what we have on the calendar. And currently, I believe the gold medal standard is top 150 in the world for women and top 200 in the world for men. Um, so uh, you accumulate points by getting bronze standards or higher. Uh, top 20 point getters in the pro in program are going to earn gold medal status, but you also actually have to have a gold medal time standard to achieve that. That's kind of the the asterisk that goes on there. Um, and then uh, silver is like the next so many teams and bronze is it rounds the, the field out. But it's, uh, it's a great recognition program for, for performance. Uh, and, you know, me and, and I, I'm really fortunate because this is the third gold medal club I've been involved with. Um, you know, I coached at Lake Erie Silver Dolphins at the beginning of my career. And uh, we were gold medal simply for the fact that we had an Olympian, you know, having Diana Munns um really helped us out um and that was unique like it was that was one way to do it uh, coach own program um you know a lot of loose coaching and not a lot of parameters this you know kind of you knew what the general context was go do a good job um and then uh, i coached the carmel swim club for 11 years and started out there where we had no recognition and uh worked our way up to bronze silver and i mean i i still vividly remember the day that we went gold medal um and getting that call at Carmel, like that was that was awesome. Just the, the culmination of work to get to that place, and then being you know fortunate to take over here at Dynamo, uh, a program that is um, you know a major part of the Club Excellence program. I think we've been gold medal every year but one, um, and the one year that we weren't was the were, was the, the year that Jason passed away, um, and we certainly had enough points, but the performance standards weren't quite there for obvious reasons, but. Uh, I, I think it's just something that we use to measure ourselves against, um, well, first regionally and, and locally, uh, we have other really, really good clubs in the metro Atlanta area and in the Southeast. Um, 
but also to know where we're at on a national standpoint. Um, it's a great motivator for our kids, for our staff, and for our families. Sure. And, and going into that, Ian, how do you communicate the significance of the Club Excellence Program to your staff, your volunteers, your parents, uh, and most importantly, the athletes who, who are ultimately responsible for the performances that earn you that status? Yeah, I mean, I think we start with the staff. You know, I think they're always the conduit that are going to go out to, um, you know, the parents. I think if you, when you send out broad emails to your program, um, you know, they, they get read, but really it's the group emails that are going to get read first. So I think we, we put it on the individual coaches to educate, um, you know, our members. And look, it takes a village. And I think that's our approach to all of our recognition uh, pieces. Like we, we don't only value just, uh, you know, club excellence. Like we, we believe in the club recognition program. We're level four. Like we, we are highly organized as a business and um, do a pretty good job administratively. Uh, we're a safe sport recognized club and we value that as well. Like we want uh, a safe, positive, you know, diverse and inclusive environment for our athletes as well. Um, and on the performance side, uh, we, we value club excellence. And we share all those things with our membership. We, we talk about with the staff on why we're doing it, what's important behind it, what's the importance behind it. Um, and then we, we come up with our bullet points on how we're going to educate our parents, how we're going to educate our kids, um, and then use it as motivational tools for, you know, especially our top level athletes. I mean, it's one, something we share with, you know, our senior one and senior two groups on a regular basis. Like here is what it takes to be a gold medal club, because ultimately you guys are going to be the ones carrying the load of that. You know, you're going to be the ones turning in the standards and uh, they get excited about it. They rally behind it. And it's something we, you know, we talk about all levels on a pretty frequent basis. That's fantastic. And it's great to hear that. It seems to me the kids in your program are valuing that journey to gold medal. And so there are a lot of core values that go into that. Talk to us about your core values. And I know you and your background. I know how important values are at Carmel. And I know you've transitioned a lot of what you learned there to Dynamo. So talk about how the core values of Dynamo are really the facilitator of your club excellence quest. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. We were just hanging new banners in the, uh, in the 50 meter pool today actually and had some core values go up. But um, we've got some things that we, we've actually just reworked the core values as well. I think that that's something that, you know, an organization needs to revisit ever so many years because ultimately the people who are who are executing the work whether it's athletes volunteers or or staff members um you know on a daily basis they got to believe in what they're doing so we went through a process of where we kind of you know revisited what our core values were um and we added to the list a little bit so you know things that we talk about on a regular basis grit that's a huge one that's always been here at dynamo um you know just just perseverance and being willing to embrace struggle and embrace failure on your way to to success and eventually excellence um you know we believe in innovation as a staff as athletes you know as parents like creating new ways new pathways to be the best we can be um you know gratitude that was, was one that was added you know just because um you know, i think that's an important thing just you know, from a societal standpoint right now just being grateful for what you have and you know, we, we are like, we're very fortunate. We own and operate facilities, but there's not a lot of flash to them. You know, they're, they're, they're not, they're not these state of the art, you know, behemoths that are $30 million. Like they're very functional. They do a lot for you. And we're really grateful to have those things. Um, and I think getting the athletes to, to express that in an early age and carry it through the program has been really important. Um, you know, growth is a big one as well. Um, you know, growth and grit are probably like our two biggest ones. Those are the ones that are always going to show up on our shirts. Um, but, but growth and, and having a growth mindset is something that is talked about, um, you know, probably the first time you step on deck with your parents and you're going to go through a new summer evaluation, that's going to be mentioned, you know, that's who we are. That's what we believe in. So I think celebrating those things, um, and, and look at the end of the day, like I, I'm highly competitive. Like I like to win. I, I like to break records. I like to go fast, but this isn't about the swimming, you know, and the core values are are really the, you know, the foundation of what we're trying to teach these young people so that they can become, you know, successful leaders in life for the rest of, you know, whatever they choose to do, whether it's in the medical field, they want to be a lawyer, they want to be an engineer, or they want to be a swim coach, you know, like we're, we're preparing them for not only success in the pool, but things way, way further down the road. I think it's so important that you mentioned, you know, you revisited the core values, because as your team grows, as you become more successful, you have to evolve. 
and it's really interesting to hear that, you know, during the COVID process, you're, you're kind of rethinking, you know, what your vision is for the future. I think that's really important. How's the staff received that so far? Good. I mean, I think like, like everybody changes hard, you know, um, you, know you, you, you get lulled into comfort and, uh, you know, you want to keep doing the things that you've always done, but, you know, keep doing what you've always done. You're only going to get what you've always gotten. Like if we want new and, and better things, um, we're going to have to stretch ourselves. And at the same time, like we're asking our athletes to show up every single day and embrace struggle and embrace that process. And we better be leading the way with it. And you know what? We better demand that out of our families too, because, um, and, and no better time have we seen that than right now. I mean, who out there isn't experiencing, you know, this craziness with the schedule and trying to get workouts in different facilities at, at odd times during the day, people have been extremely adaptable and have been welcoming to that. So, um, you know, I, I think it, you're good, really good programs out there. If they're, they're doing a good job with the core values and promoting this, like people are responding well. Grit and growth mindset right now. Is so critical for everyone. Um, in part of the club excellence program for those coaches who don't know, uh, when you reach the silver and gold medal status, you do get some funding from USA Swimming. If you don't mind sharing with us, what has your club done with some of those funds that you get to USA Swimming to put back into the program? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've always tried to use the funding um, so that it reaches as many of our members as possible. Uh, you know, I think at the silver medal level, you're going to look at anywhere between $2,000 to $3,000 on average. Um, gold, it's usually going to be eleven to twelve thousand dollars on average, which it, it's not a massive amount of money. But if you know how to use it well and stretch it well, like you can make it really impact a lot of people. Um, and we've we've done it. For this, you know, we've done various things to assist our membership. Uh, we've had you know people like David Benzel or other speakers come in and work with our athletes, our coaches, and our parents. Uh, we've made technological advances, whether that's buying iPads or GoPros or uh, most recently using sideline scout, like we're going to be purchasing sideline scout and having that at all of our facilities, um, you know, dry land equipment or equipment that can be used across uh, the program as well. Um, you know, I think we enhanced like our starting blocks and things like that at one point. So it's like things that, you know, that as many people in the program are going to touch that one piece of equipment or have access to it. Like that's what we try to do. And that's a challenge for us and something I'm very cautious of because we have multiple sites and like, we just can't throw it all into one facility. We want to make sure that we're spreading the wealth and, and everyone is seeing a piece of that so that, you know, we, we celebrate being a team to create that gold medal standard. And we want to make sure we're celebrating the fact that everyone gets to, you know, to participate and, and, you know, the accolades will be received because of it. So I'll give you an example here or a hypothetical. You and I are starting Murray aquatics tomorrow. We're building a new team. Give me your three most impactful action items that we need to do immediately. Three. Oof. That's tough. Um, you know, I think first and foremost, you got to get the right people on the bus, you know, um, and that starts with your athletes and your families. And, and, and don't get me wrong, like it, it's great to accept new people um, and, and make your numbers robust and to you know, you see that added revenue means that you can have more resources to use and things like that. But ultimately, like, are they, are they members that you value and people who are going to contribute to the culture you're trying to create? And I think sometimes there's teams out there to maybe make mistakes and there's, you know, they will take you, but, you know, six months down the road, they're, they're, they're a little hesitant about why they did it. And, um, you know, we, we're pretty good at that. I think we try to identify people that, is this the right fit for you? You know, is this going to be the right place? And at the same time, like, we're not afraid to have conversations with people who have been here for a while say, hey, this isn't working out. Like, you might want to explore other options because it doesn't, it doesn't know one any good, whether it's the athlete, the parents, or the coaches. You know, if you're not aligned with what the common goals are, then, you know, let, let's go our separate ways and find the places where you're going to be happy and we're going to be able to function a little bit better. So uh, I think that's important. I think getting your coaches online. Um, and I think most importantly, like, don't hire people because of what their swimming pedigree is. Like, Hire the person, teach the job. Uh, I, you know, who's passionate about coaching? Who's passionate about learning? Who's passionate about growing? Those are the people that I want to employ. Um, and, and don't get me wrong, there's plenty of people who are really good swimmers out there that, that fit that quality, but there's a lot of people who are very average swimmers or no swimming background at all who, who fit that quality even more. So um, getting great coaches. And ultimately, if you're, if you're a board run organization, um, 
you know, really good board members who are going to be able to be very good at removing their parent hat and, and putting their governance hat on and help make sure that they're establishing the correct policies and procedures for you to operate under. Um, and then once you've got all those people there, you just got to make sure that everyone's paddling in the right direction. You know, I think that that's crucial. Um, you know, once you got the right people on the bus, I think uh, your first priority is making sure you're athlete centered, you're coach driven and you're board assisted. And, and that has always got to be the focus is that we're here for the kids and we're here for the athletes and their development. And the coaches are going to envision whatever process there is to help them with their long-term athletic development. And, and the board is there to basically say like, what do you need from us? How can we support you? And the best organizations that I've ever worked with or been a part of all represent that. Um, and then finally, I would say high standards. You know, I think there's, High achievement always takes place in the framework of high expectation. And I'm never going to apologize for having high standards or, or wanting to be the very best we can be. And we're gonna be very rigid in our application of those standards, but we're going to be flexible in, you know, how that is handed out to the different levels of the program. You know, just because if I'm coaching, you know, a senior one athlete here at Dynamo, like high standards are high standards. Like you've been in the program for a while, like you know, we have high expectations of what you show up and do on a daily basis. You're new to the program and you're sitting in one of our developmental groups. It doesn't mean we can't have high standards for you, but how we're going to teach you and what we're going to hold you accountable to is going to be similar, but, you know, probably not as strict. But I don't think there's a problem for having that at all levels of the program. Sure. And I, and I think the development of your staff is in, indicative of those expectations as well. Would you agree? I do agree, yes. I think the staff following through with the expectations, especially from head coach down is critically important as you know, but when the athletes are being held accountable, that forces the staff to be accountable as well. And, and yeah. I think that dynamic is critically important. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's something that, you know, as a young coach, I struggled with. And, and one of the things I really work with some of our younger coaches on is that you know, we believe in teaching first here, like, you know, we, we teach before we train and, um, you know, with the old John Wooden thing, like if, you know, you haven't taught it until like they, they've truly learned it. Like if they're still making mistakes, like that's on you. And it's one thing to teach the skill and, you know, administer the video, you know, whatever, but where's the follow-up, you know, are, are you, are you on that kid afterwards? Are you really paying attention to their stroke counts? Are you really paying attention to that stroke change? Are you following up with them later in the practice, the next day, the next week? Um, that's something as a young coach, I think is really vital to your success is developing that skill early on. No doubt about it. You're very lucky to have a tremendous staff. You've been a part of some really great coaching staffs. How do we incentivize our best staff members to stay with the program and continue on. Of course, we want to get them to a place where, you know, their growth is imminent and they're going to have some opportunities, but how do we create a scenario where maybe we incentivize them to stay with our program? I think it's part and parcel to creating that gold medal of excellence level. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at the top, you know, sports organizations or really any organizations out there, you're going to see continuity in key positions. Um, you know, like, like the New England Patriots are good, are good because Bill Belichick's been there forever. And, you know, there's a system and it works. And um, you can look at that across all professional sports. But if you look at even, you know, the collegiate level and club level across all different sports in the United States, you know, the consistency in coaching is huge. And, and you're right. Like, I do think it's a fine line because as much as I believe in developing athletes and preparing them for the transition to their next step in their swimming journey, um, you know, I'm going to want our coaches to do the same thing. I'm going to want to be able to prepare them so that they can go be a great head age group coach or be a great head coach at some point in a small program and start climbing a ladder much like I did. And, um, you know, if I can provide that for them, um, you know, like that, that's a, that's a big piece of satisfaction for me. As far as incentivizing them, um, you know, one of the things I try to do is like, I like trying to keep an open deck when I have, you know, my group in the water and particularly like Saturday mornings, like Saturday morning is basically like an open invitation to come to senior one practice. Like if you want to show up and you want to coach and you want to be on deck during that time, I'd love to have you. And I'm probably not going to say, Hey, here's your workout. Here's your stopwatch. Go stand over that lane and call times. Like I'm like, go coach that lane. You know, like they're working on brushstroke. I want your, I want your lens on there. Go coach them today. See what happens. 
Um, but there's, there's usually an open invitation to come in and share a deck with people. Um, I, I do think that the best programs out there are probably finding ways to, to help coaches financially. Um, you know, there are limitations in our sport right now, like, and, and especially now during COVID, there's, there's teams out there that are probably struggling who can't do a whole lot, but, um, you know, ways to keep people around financially is, is really important. But ultimately, like, I found that, like, getting people around and getting them things they want to do and growth opportunities is way more important, important than any type of money you're going to give them. So um, I think it's making sure that coaches are getting the right challenge at the, at the correct time. And that doesn't necessarily mean that, oh, now you've got to coach a group higher than you're coaching. Sometimes like you need to coach a group that's just very different from what you're coaching so that you can see it differently. And, um, you know, like I, my journey through Carmel, like I was a head group coach there for six years and eventually I was always coaching with senior and eventually I moved to senior only. And uh, there were times where I was needed to come back down and coach age group. And every time that I was asked to do it, like I, you know, stomp my feet and I'm like, I, don't, I really don't want to do this. I'm going to go back to doing it. And then you're on deck for a few weeks. You're like, okay, this is pretty awesome. You know, like get to coach kids that are like drastically different from like the high performance, high performance athletes you were just working with. And now like it's just about fun and learning and it, it was just a great way to reset the day so um that was an important piece for me to be successful in both aspects at that time but i didn't realize it at first and so hungry at that age you know hungry to just learn and have fun at practice you know there's there's a certain level of cynicism right as the kids get older but at that age group level you know they're so hungry i love going down and and hanging with our group at, at that age because they just want to race and i love that mentality yeah i've often said that you know when i'm when i'm done being a head coach and i want to take a step back like give me a group of 11 to 14 year olds to coach someplace in just <laughs> some obscure town like i'll be happy as can be you know yeah george breen in middle atlantic did it for a long time he was olympian and great coach for a long time and then uh, right up until his i think he was 90 he was coaching 11 12s and they was coaching 11 12s at a very high level so uh, that's a fun group to work with um you know, a great coaching staff is critical, but there's so many other key roles that people fill within our organization. You know, my size of team, we have 200 athletes. You have 800 plus members on your team. So Dynamo, obviously a lot different than a lot of clubs around the country, but how do you as the head coach manage and collaborate all these moving parts so that you are traveling in the direction of the gold medal status? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And, um, you know, probably some background first, that we are a large organization because, uh, you know, competitively, we're traditionally a little over 800 athletes. Uh, we're we're going to probably touch between three and 400 pre-competitive athletes in a given year. We're usually given, you know, 12, 13,000 swim lessons in a year. Um, you know, we have a pool management firm, we have masters, we have multi-sport, we have all these things that are under the Dynamo umbrella. Um, so first and foremost, like I have a really good partner. Uh, so there are two executives at Dynamo, myself as head, as head coach, and then our CEO, Mike Cotter. And um, we are essentially partners and we just manage different parts of the program. So anything that's competitive and on the wet side, I'm in charge of that. And anything that's kind of not, Mike handles that. Um, and I mean, we check in daily, you know, we, we talk about big picture items. We talk about daily items. Mike is often in on the coaching staff meetings and, and usually doesn't participate. He's more just being a fly on the wall, making sure he's up to speed with what's going on. As am I when it comes to our swim school and, and other aspects of what's going on, um, you know, outside of the competitive realm. Uh, so I think having a really good partner there is important. Um, we're a very good staff when it comes to collaboration. Like I'm a collaborative leader. Like that's when I work best. So you know, getting me in a room with other people or, or helping stimulate conversation between our staff is when I'm typically at my best. Um, and I think if you're not doing that, you're missing out because like I've got really good coaches and really good minds and I, I want to hear their thoughts. But I also know that like once you give people the opportunity to speak and participate in that process, they're going to believe way more in what you're doing than if you just gave them this piece of paper and say, hey, here's the memo. This is what we're doing. Um, and, and even if they disagree with it at first, like they've had their say, they, they've been allowed to speak their mind, they're going to go out and they're going to have a lot easier time towing the company line um, when they've had, you know, some thought in what, you know, policies and procedures are being developed for the athletes that they're working with. Um, 
and then we, we do a really good job from, from a staff meeting standpoint. Like we meet weekly um, as a staff. Right now we're still doing it via Zoom, but traditionally that's in person. It's a Tuesday morning, uh, usually, you know, bagels or breakfast, we bring it in. There's, you know, 15, 20 minutes of social time. Um, we begin each meeting by celebrating each other, kind of going through the week and saying, hey, I want to recognize so-and-so because I saw this and just celebrating great things we saw each other do on deck or away from the pool. Um, and then we kind of get into some logistics on what's going on that particular week. What do we all need to be aware of? And then we'll do some education or big picture things at the end of each meeting. Um, but I, I mean, I, we're, we are talking regularly. We have a very active group me. Um, you know, I, I preach communication. So uh, I'd rather over communicate than under communicate. So I think sometimes the staff is like, oh man, here's another email from Ian, but <laughs> I'd rather just have that information so they know. Sure. And that, that's a really interesting part of your staff meeting where you go around and you kind of celebrate, you know, uh, something positive that you saw one of the staff members do. Is that, is that always taken seriously? And, and how do the staff uh, respond to that every week? Yeah, it was not done before I arrived here. Um, and my, my introduction of that is actually through the Positive Coaching Alliance. So uh, in my time at Carmel, uh, one of the staff members we had was Dr. <coughs> Rock King. And um, Rock was involved with the Positive Coaching Alliance and brought in some of that information to us at Carmel. And eventually, like, we, we bought into it, and it became a big part of the team culture there. And one of the things the, you did with the athletes on a regular basis, usually weekly, was called Winter Circle. And you sit in a circle, and they celebrate one another. And it's just a way for them to speak about what they saw during the school day or on the pool deck or at a meet and, and celebrate someone. Um, because often, you know, we, we celebrate the kids, but they get tired of hearing that. When they hear it from their peers, like it means a little bit more. Um, and then we adopted it to use it at staff meetings as well. And when I came here, um, you know, our staff meetings were good, but like it just seemed like it was all business. You know, it was just like almost tense in the room. It's like, okay, like let's lighten up a little bit and enjoy our time together. Um, so the first couple of weeks were a little, you know, people were a little on edge, didn't really know what to say. But I think now um, people come in with lists of things to say, which is pretty wow. cool. Wow. And they're probably taking a little bit more responsibility and looking for things that are good to talk about, which, which I think that in and of itself creates a really positive environment for, for the staff as a whole. I think that's awesome. Um, you have like we said, over 800 athletes in your program, a lot of moving parts. With every athlete comes a parent. What strategies do you use to ensure that you as the head coach are accessible uh, to your parents? Yeah, I mean, I, I think people know that, you know, my door's always open. You know, my, my contact information is easily available for people to reach out to me. Um, but we do have three competitive sites. Uh, I coach primarily at Chambly, and we have sites in Decatur and Alpharetta as well. And I try to get out to those sites when I can. Um, you know, if I can get away on a weeknight and, and go spend the night at Decatur and see what's going on there, um, I'll do that. Uh, usually, you know, when we're not in COVID times, I'm actually coaching up at Alpharetta one night a week. Um, matter of fact, uh, Brian, who leads the site up there and coaches our senior one group up there, he'll come down and coach my group, and I'll go up and coach his group. Um, usually I try to go up a little bit early and if I can, I stay a little bit later that, that night just so I could spend some time on deck with the staff, see some different athletes, just walk around and be available for people to talk to me if, if they choose. I think that's important to talk about because a lot of parents, uh, in my experience, would be very nervous and are still very nervous when I go to our other site one night a week to the point where I have to do some parent education about it. But Talk about why it's important for those other athletes to see and spend time with you and for your athletes to get feedback and input from another coach on your staff. Yeah, well, I mean, first and foremost, we may be multiple sites, but we're one team. You know, we, we don't operate as, you know, Dynamo Alpharetta and Dynamo Shambly. We operate as Dynamo. And, um, you know, the kids that I'm going to work with, we, we're fortunate that we actually train together with them on Saturdays, most times during the year. And in the summer, we're training with them probably two or three times a week. So we see them on a relatively frequent basis normally. Um, and I think my athletes know that if I'm willing to put other people in front of them and coach them, they, they know that I value them and their input. Um, 
And if I don't want you in front of the athletes, then I'm not going to put you in front of the athletes. I think that's, you know, my kids know that. Uh, so I think they know that if I'm willing to have Ryan or any other coach go down there and lead the group, um, it's important. And we, we talk about that with the kids on a regular basis that, look, I, I like to think that I'm pretty good at what I do, but like my lens is my lens and the way that I communicate is the way that I communicate. And I'm, I've been doing this long enough where I'm not going to reach every athlete the way that I want to. I'm going to have communication breakdowns with some people just because like that's how we're built and we're going to really struggle there. But I also am pretty good identifying that my assistant coach or one of our other assistant coaches does connect with that kid and can get that message across. And we're, we're going to use that opportunity. Um, so there are, there are athletes that I have that Brian connects with really well. Um, and there's kids up at Alpharetta that I connect with really well. So um, I just think having a different lens um, and just hearing it a little bit differently because you know, if, if you and I were talking about a freestyle breath, our language, while we might end up saying something that's pretty similar in the end, like the way we're going to describe it is going to be slightly different. And that's going to impact each athlete slightly differently. And you know what, at some point, like you're going to be able to resonate with someone I coach better than I am and vice versa. Absolutely. I, I think having that perspective, right, is, is what, what leads to growth within the athlete, too. You know, hearing it from a different perspective means a lot. What are the types of parent education programs that you do, Ian? How do you reach out to your parents and, and what do you guys do to make them feel more connected to the program? Yeah, I think we actually talked about this a little bit um, when I was on with, with Chris Plum, you know, a while back in the spring. Uh, this is like one of the benefits of Zoom that we have discovered. Um, you know, being a multi-site program, we would often conduct parent meetings about certain topics. Like you have your traditional group parent meeting every season where it's just like, hey, here's what's going on in the group and, you know, all of that. But then we talk about long-term athletic development and the importance of dry land and, um, you know, the 10 under swimmer and volunteering at swim meets and eventually the college talk. You know, we, we did all those things, but we did them in person so that I or another coach would have to do it at three different sites over a week or over a couple of weeks. And that's great, but like, it's taxing, you know, especially when you're already coaching odd hours and you've got a lot of other things going on your plate in the middle of meat season. Um, so with Zoom, we discovered that like we could reach our entire membership um, all at once and we could record them. So uh, we, we've taken advantage of, we really took advantage of the time when we were not in the water to create basically recordings for all those things. Um, and that was a big help. Those were, those were really appreciated people tuned in well to them. Um, and it's a great way now to have those things on file so that you can send it out to new families as they come. Uh, so we try to, you know, create a schedule for the big topics that we know people need to hear. And then we're also trying to keep an eye out for the yearly challenges. Cause I think you, it, it's always a little bit cyclical. Like you'll, you'll need to come back and revisit a certain parent topic every three or four years, just because of the group of people that are coming into the program or, you know, moving through the program at any given time, like you want to make sure they're hearing, um, you know, stuff that's important for them at that particular time. And how active, if at all, do, do you have a parent booster association or fundraising events? How do you parents engage? How do you engage your parents in that capacity? So we have, I mean, we have group parents. So there's usually you know, anywhere from one to three parents that are associated with each training group. And they act as kind of like, you know, they're, they're the social organizer, obviously. But um, you know, they can kind of be a conduit for the coaches to use to get to particular people when it comes to any type of fundraising events or other activities that we're going to offer. Um, we try to kind of consolidate our fundraising into just one or two efforts a year. Um, I, don't, I don't like to nickel and dime people. I'd rather say like, okay, this is what we're doing. Uh, they know it's coming in advance. We'd really appreciate a gift, you know, whatever you, you feel comfortable giving. Um, and then one of the things we're working on with our board is that creating more committees within the board and, and putting people on the board who have backgrounds in the things that we need them to do. Um, so like finding a professional fundraiser or knowing that you have a lawyer on the board or knowing that you have someone with marketing experience and you lean on them for advice. Um, and they usually kind of come up with a parent group that helps us handle that particular portion of the program. 
One of the things that I stole from you probably about three or four years ago is you have a great team newsletter. And I don't know how often you send it out, but I started doing that and, and boy, it makes a huge difference. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, we use, um, we use constant contact uh, and it's typically bi-monthly. So it's, it's twice a month, usually the first and the 15th. Um, probably doing it monthly just because there's not as much information to share. Uh, but again, the any of the information that's typically in those newsletter is going out in other modes like throughout the month or in time leading up to it. But like we were consolidating it um, and using something like, you know, constant contact or MailChimp where like you can clean it up and make it look pretty, pretty slick. Um, you know, that was always great. And we typically had a parent volunteer do that as well. Um, we've actually brought that internal now uh, where we have one coach and uh, in the, you know, the past, six to 12 months we've hired some customer service reps that work at the facilities um they're kind of handling the the business side and the coach is handling more of the team side they collaborate and send it out just it sounds to me like you you guys have a great flow of workforce collaboration and everybody is working inside their zone but at the same time you know you've created space for coaches to grow and do other things i love the saturday morning practice thing what else are you doing to help your coaches uh, grow in terms of staff development? Yeah, well, I, I think I'm gonna like address the first thing you said there. Like we, our, our coaching staff plays a vital role in our administration. Um, and we have like an administrative job matrix that is usually renewed every year. And that's anywhere from team registration to billing, to ordering all-star towels and team apparel and things like that. And um, you know, some of our more experienced staff members have been doing things for a while and like we let them handle their, their business and like, they're like, okay, I'm going to keep doing apparel or I want to do, you know, Brian handles billing and, and things like that. But as we bring new staff members in, we try to rotate the jobs quite frequently because, you know, we're usually going to try to find you two or three jobs, two that we know you're going to be really good at, like this is right in your wheelhouse and one that is usually out of your wheelhouse where it's like, okay, time to learn and figure something out. You, you're going to need to do this, this differently. And um, I also try not to give them a whole lot of parameters when it comes to the job, you know, it's like, okay, here's what's been done in the past, run with it. Tell me what you come up with. I don't like, I don't want to hear like, well, this is what we've always done. Like, there's always a way to improve it, you know, and um, I encourage that. Like, if they come to me after a couple months of reviewing things and say, hey, I think I want to do this instead. I think it's going to be received better. You know, we'll have a sit down meeting and I'll either give them the thumbs up or the thumbs down and we'll roll with it. But um yeah, like I, I do think, you know, getting the staff involved is, is huge. Um, and now I've been talking so long about it, I forgot about the actual, actual question. So, um, you know, uh, yeah, like I think getting your staff involved is, is massive. And the, the growth piece and, and giving them things to do is, is huge. And again, buy into what you're trying to accomplish as an organization. Like you're not just showing up and being on deck and coaching this group. Like they've got real roles to play with some very vital pieces of, of, you know, administrative work that need to get done for us to operate at our peak levels. Ian, it, one of the hot topics right now in the coaching community is, is coaches, mental health and wellness. And it's something that a lot of people are talking about. A lot of people are starting to spend time on. How have you at Dynamo started to investigate this with your staff? How are you incorporating some reminders for them to take time, take breaks, get rest? Because in this business, we can work ourselves, you know, into oblivion. So what are, what are some strategies that you use personally? And, and how do you talk to your staff about this? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's an important one for me. And frankly, something that I am not doing a very good job of right now. Um, you know, uh, back when we weren't swimming, so like March to, to May, like I was crushing it, like, you know, working out every day and feeling really good. And like, we got back in the water and like, like many coaches right there, and I'm certainly not complaining, but I'm coaching seven days a week right now. You know, I'm on deck more than I traditionally am and you have all this other work that's on top of it we're just finishing up a capital project and you've got just the stress of everything else that's going on around you so um it's tough for me personally right now and um you know one of the biggest things that i struggle with that probably many head coaches do uh you know that island of leadership you know you don't have a whole lot of people who are in the same situation that are readily accessible for you to speak to um so 
I'm on a couple of text feeds and yeah, I've got a couple of close, close coaching friends across the country who are in similar situations. We try to check in on one another and make sure everybody's doing okay. Um, and I expect the same thing out of our staff. And that started, you know, we, we always do it. Like, I mean, we talk about celebrating each other at the beginning of, of staff meetings, but, you know, we very much discussed like taking care of each other and taking care of business on a regular basis. But once we went into shelter in place in Georgia, like that was basically the first thing we talked about every staff meeting is that, um, you know, talk about who you've been speaking to, um, you know, like how, what are you doing to, you know, stay in a good place right now? People were sharing their ideas. And then we were basically making sure that we were checking in on each other, you know, two or three different coaches every single day, like call someone, send a text message, you know, go for a walk with someone in social distance, whatever. Um, so we did a pretty good job with that. Uh, and look, I, like, I want our coaches to handle their business and make sure they're doing their work and coach really hard. And if they need time away, um, while they're doing that, we're going to be really open to letting them do it. Um, and I think that's something that we're pretty good at stepping up and helping each other and covering other workouts so that someone can get a break, you know? Um, and I think that's really important right now. It's because we are, we always are working pretty odd hours and often long hours. And in, in these times, like we're doing it even more. Like I was talking to a good friend who coaches in Kentucky and, you know, he's coaching in four different groups at a large club right now, every single day. And some of those groups, he's coaching the boys and then the girls in separate workouts. So they're on deck for eight or nine hours every single day. Um, that's extremely taxing. So uh, I think, you know, we've got to have really hard looks in the mirror about what we're doing and knowing when to say when. Um, I think it's really important that we're checking in on one another and and being willing to step up and say like, hey, like you've got to take a break or, um, you know, let's have a talk about where you're at. Um, thankfully, I've got some good friends who have done that with me. Uh, you know, I, it's it's always an important thing and it's a growing thing in our profession, but never more so than right now for me. Uh, that's a great response. And I feel like I try to be mindful of it. And then in my own career, I looked back, I said, I said this morning in our house, I said, I think I only had 36 hours off this week, <laughs> you know, from Saturday at the end of Saturday practice till back at the pool at six on Monday, you know, that's, it's a tough turnaround and, and, you know, trying to find that, that head space in between is, is always a challenge. So I, I appreciate your honesty there too. That's a great response. All right, last question, man, and you're going to laugh. Chris Plum, TJ Davis, Ian Murray. Every big swim meet, doesn't matter how hot the pool deck is, we got a long sleeve button down on. What's up with that? Where did it start? And how is that legacy being carried on? I don't know. You got to dress, dress for the job you want, not the one you have, I guess, right? You know? Um, <laughs> I don't know. Like, I mean, I think we wore our first button downs at Carmel, like 2007, 2008. There was like, I remember them, like there's these solid, really thick LL Bean shirts. Um, <laughs> and the net, before they renovated the natatorium in Indianapolis and it was, man, was it hot. Um, but yeah, it just became kind of a thing. Like you had your final shirts and, you know, also things that you could go into. I, I think you're, ultimately what it came down to was professionalism. You know, um, we wanted to look the part. And, and I'm a big believer in the polo shirt. I like, I rock my t-shirts too, but like there are times where it's like, yeah, you know, it's okay to look sharp. And, um, and especially at a place like Carmel where like, you know, if you're going out and having meetings and trying to find people that are going to donate money to help you build a pool, like you better be looking pretty good to do it. Um, and I think this people took you a little more seriously when you started to do it as well. And, um, it's funny, like, you know, like you, we did it for a while and then the next thing you know, it's like there's four or five other teams on deck doing it. And you're like, okay, well, you know, invitation and flattery, we know where that goes. Absolutely, man. I, uh, I think the athletes, like when you, you know, you're, you're at a prelim session real early in the morning, maybe you got your, your team t-shirt on. And then when the kids see you go, come into warm up, you're formalized, you're ready to rock. I think it adds a little extra enthusiasm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's business time, man. You know what's up. <laughs> Ian, thanks so much. I know you're an incredibly busy guy. I really appreciate it. Everybody who's watching, you can catch this replay right on the Coach's Corner blog on our website. Ian Murray, good luck. Have a great uh, fall, and I look forward to seeing you soon, man. Thanks, Michael. Appreciate the opportunity. All right. Take care, bud.